Lijep pozdrav iz multimedijalnog deska. Više od 120.000 rohinja izbjeglo je iz Mijanmara u Bangladeš u posljednje dvije sedmice. Kako bi se spasili od progona vojske te zemlje, pokazuje posljednji izvištaj Ujedinjenih nacija. Aktivisti za očuvanje ljudskih prava poručuju da Ujedinjene nacije moraju zauzeti oštri strap prema humanitarnoj krizi u ovoj zemlji i izbjeglicama koje pristižu u susjedne zemlje. Ova institucija saopćila je da je sva međunarodna pomoć u lijekovima i hrani u potpunosti stopirana od strane Mijanmarske vlade. And tonight we are speaking to Mr. Peter van der Auerart, sub-coordinator at the United Nations International Organization for Migrations. Mr. van der Auerart, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. How do you reflect on one of the biggest humanitarian refugee crises ongoing right now in the world? Mm -hmm. I think um, clearly we are seeing the pictures of Uh, again, a conflict that uh, affects the most vulnerable people the hardest. We've seen the pictures of women, children, elderly people uh, fleeing. As the International Organization for Migration, uh, working both in Bangladesh and in Myanmar, supporting the governments to provide humanitarian assistance, our first concern uh, is to make sure that those people that are affected by conflict are protected and that, have, that they have access to um, the things that they need, uh, food, water, medicine. shelter. Our medicine, our director general uh, issued a statement last week, which is still valid today, calling upon all sides to the ongoing violence in the Rakhine state in Myanmar to show restraint uh, and to ensure that uh, innocent civilians Um, are as much as possible spared uh, from further suffering. So in your uh, opinion, uh, has the response of the world leaders been strong or weak enough? Um, mm -hmm. What do we do? What can we do at this point? Um, I think there is always a time lag between a crisis unfolding, especially when there is a rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation, in the international community coming together to provide um, support and that's almost inevitable i think it always takes some time however we have seen um, increased international uh, attention to the issue uh, we have issued together with our partners today an appeal for funding to support bangladesh which had already been um, providing assistance to about 300,000 undocumented Myanmar nationals on its territory before the latest crisis um, and we are starting to see that there is an international solidarity um, emerging. I think it cannot be underlined uh, enough that again it is an economically relatively poor country like Bangladesh that is bearing the brunt of a large exactly. poor uh, humanitarian country taking crisis. Care of so many exactly. refugees at this point. How many IOM officials are there uh, in Myanmar and in Bangladesh at this time? We have uh, been working uh, in Rakhine State uh, providing humanitarian assistance for over a decade now, uh, both when it comes to the internally displaced people because of the violence mm -hmm and um, the consequences of natural disasters that are uh, also affecting that area particularly. Um, and we have, um, in both countries, we have um, tens of um, officials working on the ground in different communities um, to provide assistance to the population. Together, it's not only IOM, there is the United Nations, there are NGOs, and we were working collectively together to provide support uh, to those people. We have spoken to a documentarian, Mr. Shafiu Rahman, who is situated at the very border with Bangladesh, and he has told us about this very current situation in the field when it comes to refugees and the conditions therein. Today, there was this uh, young woman who was shot in the leg. 
and I think another person, I don't know how injured they were, they were also trying to cross into Bangladesh and they were shot at. So it seems that refugees are easy targets for the Myanmar army. You face uh, very swampy ground. Uh, you're talking about thick, slippery mud. And it's very, very difficult terrain. And especially if you're exhausted, especially if you have not eaten in days, been in hiding. The brutal facts of this extended conflict and this suffering should translate into immediate action by the government, by the international agencies and institutions um, in order to bring immediate relief uh, to the refugees who are poured into the country. So was something like this uh, already predictable? Um, I think predictable in the sense of being able to say that today, this or it, on the 25th of August, uh, the violence would break out. I think the answer is no. Um, was it um, a conflict or an issue that has been there for a long time? Yes. And I think um, it goes back to something that uh, UN Secretary General said in his first address to the Security Council in January of this year, uh, that it underscores the need for the international community to invest more into the prevention of uh, conflict. There were efforts uh, in Myanmar, uh, started, initiated by the Myanmar government with the Kofi Annan-led advisory commission for the Rakhine state, where it seemed there was hope on the horizon that uh, there was the foundations for a political solution were being laid, led. But I think um, a crisis was not a great surprise to observers of the region. Uh, that this type of event would happen, I think everyone was uh, thinking that this was a possibility. Um, I think the commentary uh, shows uh, the need for the international community now to, as quickly as possible, um, generate resources to support Bangladesh uh, in providing access to people, or providing humanitarian assistance rather to people that are often exhausted or traumatized, have gone through um, sometimes horrific abuse, women that have been victim of sexual violence, they're coming into uh, camps and places that are, were already before struggling to provide um, adequate services for these 300,000 uh, people uh, in Bangladesh that were there from Myanmar. And it is really important now in the next days, and not weeks and months, but the next days, that um, the international donors are giving mm -hmm. IOM, the UN and the NGOs active there, the means to provide this assistance uh, quickly, because these people cannot wait for weeks to get access to food, to basic medical health, to clean water and sanitation. Um, the really, basic the basic needs, needs, the basic needs uh, of a human being. Shelter. Yeah. Um, but, but we have to go back to the prevention. We could have seen over the f past few years that something like this has already happened mm -hmm. in Myanmar, in Rakhine. How come we haven't done enough to prevent the last two weeks? In, uh, ongoing right there? I, I think there is, it's something that uh, the UN Secretary General also highlighted in the speech he gave, and I think there is a, a tendency, uh, it's only really possible for um, whether it's international or national policymakers to address something when the house is already on fire. And uh, then it is possible to allocate people, to allocate time, to allocate money. Uh, while if there is not yet an explosion of violence, when we are not yet seeing the images on TV of people suffering, uh, it seems to be a lot more complicated. Uh, maybe it's human nature to only respond to the problems when they are really in our yeah. face and not really um, be willing or able to focus on how can we prevent them uh, when, when there isn't as yet this type of violence that we're now seeing uh, on, on the TV. And I think it's something that we as the UN system uh, have to look at, um, as the UN Secretary General suggests, more closely and allocate some of those resources in conflicts that we know are frozen maybe today, but that maybe tomorrow or in a year's time will again lead to violence if there is no political solution found that is acceptable to all sides and that we need to really identify those and put efforts into uh, mobilizing our resources and our expertise to support local actors, whether it's the government, whether it's the communities, to start resolving those problems. Because otherwise we're going to see these cycles, not particularly in Myanmar, but everywhere where we see conflict today, we're going to see these cycles recurring uh, all the time. And it's really something that 
we need to be repeating as much as you can, and I think also in the media, to say we need to look at those frozen conflicts or low intensity conflicts and invest resources there to politically address them. Because at the end of the day, it's political solutions, development solutions that are going to bring peace and stability, not humanitarian not assistance. Humanitarian if assistance. you have to do humanitarian assistance, it's too late. It's because too late. Then you're already there. You're already there. You're already there. Yeah. We have spoken to some human rights activists and they think that only civilians around the globe were the ones who really spoke out for uh, the victims in Myanmar. Um, we have spoken to a human rights activist from United Kingdom today, Jamila Hanan, and this is what she told us. Myanmar's civilian-led government, which took office in March 2016, we can say that it has failed to meet expectations to carry out significant reforms. Do you agree with that? Yes, Aung San Suu Kyi has been a great disappointment even before she came into power from the moment she was released in house arrest shortly after the Rohingya were being driven from the homes, even back then in 2012, and she remained silent then. We kept waiting for her to speak out. People said when she comes to power, she will speak out for these people. And of course she didn't. So that's been a huge disappointment. The Rohingya people are neglected, we believe, because they're such a minority. They have no power and it's easy to ignore them. But they're arriving now in the hundreds of thousands, literally 137,000, I think is 100, sorry, 123,000 is the latest figures of people that have fled just in the past up to 10 days. And that's on top of the hundreds of thousands that were already there in that area. These people are living in absolute squalor. They're arriving with absolutely nothing and there's very little help for them when they get there. So we really need to send a clear message to the United Nations that this isn't acceptable. They need to be true just like refugees anywhere else. Your comment? Well, I think the, the point of, um, as I said earlier, the point of humanitarian assistance is critical here. And I think um, it is very important and it's something that our Director General has called upon all actors to ensure that humanitarian assistance to vulnerable people, whether they are refugees, whether they are internally displaced people, is possible. Um, as I mentioned, we are, together with our partners, providing humanitarian assistance in Bangladesh. Um, it is a big challenge for Bangladesh, it, as it, we said. It is already. a big, big challenge, and the issues of access, um, it's not an issue of access there, it's more an issue of resources. But I think in the conflict of Myanmar, like in, in the Rakhine state, like in any other conflict, it is really important. And I think in, globally this has become increasingly a problematic issue that all the actors that are involved in conflict respect um, the right to people to receive humanitarian assistance and respect the need for humanitarian actors like ourselves who are politically neutral, who are not, our role is not to take sides in conflict, our role is not to denounce How is it possible parties. To, to be neutral in, in, right in this situation? We are not really talking about a conflict here. We are seeing uh, a side in, in a country, like we said, uh, civil-led uh, government, uh, Basically, it's not official, but it's pretty obvious, uh, ethnically cl cleansing the, the, the area. How mm. to stay objective? What, why is it important to stay uh, objective in this, in this point and mm. be politically neutral? How well, to do that in this uh, situation? W when we see a conflict, like whether it's in Syria, whether it's in South Sudan, whether it's now in the Rakhine state in Myanmar, if I may put it in this way, we are not seeing the political sides of it. What we are seeing is people suffering. And we are seeing people that are denied or cannot fulfill their basic human needs. That is what we are seeing. And our, for us as an IOM, as an actor, our priority is to have access to those people and to make sure that to the extent that we can, that we support government or any other actors providing humanitarian assistance to those people. And not that getting is, into conflict yourself. That is our, that is our role. Right. It's a distinct role from human rights NGOs, human rights NGOs right. um, or political organizations. These things are different. And I think to preserve the humanitarian space, it is very important to keep that political And be really careful in and doing be, exactly, exactly that. Exactly. In doing exactly. that. Has the media done right? Uh, uh, in the past few days. We have seen inc increase on, uh, of accounts on social media uh, posing information that we could call fake information. Mm. Uh, what do we do in that kind of case? We, as journalists, we have to be, I mean, in the field, we have to be really smart in trying to distinguish the difference between 
what is the right information, what is the wrong information. How does that reflect on the United Nations, IOM, and in general the public opinion? It, it has become, I think, um, or your task has become increasingly complicated, I believe, because of the social media, because of the, the ease that one can nowadays put something on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook and claim that it's a proof of something or an evidence, evidence of something. And there was a very good piece on, in The Guardian today highlighting the use of images sometimes from the Rwandan genocide in '94. Uh, by people on Twitter or on social media uh, to show as evidence of atrocities committed by this side or the other side. I think... And it's only fueling... It's only fueling the polarization. And I think um, the media, and I think that doesn't particularly only go for this conflict, but I think it is really important for serious media to avoid contributing to the polarization that inevitably exists when a conflict starts. And I think... Um, with the dwindling resources for journalists to send people uh, on the ground, um, with social media often being the first to um, reveal something, um, I think it's even more important today for um, the mainstream media to um, try to, as, ob as much as they can, objectively present the facts that they know and not take sides in a conflict or not declare something to be uh, this or that on, on half information or uh, information that is unverified. And I think that the media in this particular conflict or the Syrian conflict, there are a lot of things that can be said that the media could have done differently um, that maybe would have helped also the international response because sometimes this polarization by the media makes our work as humanitarian actors mm -hmm. uh, more complicated Before and that's anything, not what we want. Uh, we have to think uh, in, a, in a humane base, mm. on a humane basis. Uh, before I'm a journalist or mm. you're a, a UN IOM official, we are all humans and we have to see what we together, what we can achieve in order to help innocent men, women, mm. children and elderly in, in, in this particular case, what are your recommendations for the next, let's say, can we, can we look in, let's say, uh, five or six days from now? Mm. What will happen? Will this come down? And what are we out to do? Mm. I mean, our um, expectations are, unfortunately, that we will continue to see population movements uh, from uh, Myanmar uh, into Bangladesh for um, at least in the short term. And I don't think that, or we don't believe that these movements will stop. So in the next few days, the priority is to scale up the humanitarian assistance, both in the affected areas in the Rakhine state, in Myanmar, for the people that have been left behind, and those people that are now in Bangladesh, the undocumented Myanmar nationals that are there, just to, to increase as quickly as we all can humanitarian assistance. However, of course, the humanitarian assistance will not provide a solution to this conflict. At the same time, there needs to be an investment of the international community in finding a political solution to this particular issue at Is hand. Is it a long time to wait until there is a political solution found? Um, United Nations, as human activists say, as, as public opinion is, the United Nations have to act immediately. Mm. They have been called to act immediately. IOM ha has been called to act immediately. Is this going to happen eventually, mm -hmm. that everybody's going to act immediately? Well, I can only speak to the humanitarian side, and uh, I know that IOM, UNHCR, um, the NGOs that are active are doing everything that they can to increase their, um, the assistance that they provide. So in that sense, I can be confident to say, we, will it be enough? No, because there are when so many people arrive in such a short period of time, even in the best resourced humanitarian assistance uh, situation in the world, we've seen in the, the migration crisis in Europe, even in uh, such a rich continent like Europe, how difficult it was to in the initial days to provide adequate humanitarian assistance. And the that's Balkan route. The Balkan route, yes. um, even some European Union member states were struggling in the first. So if those countries struggle, what does it mean for countries like that, exactly, that have a lot less 
uh, wait, resources wait. than we have. The political side I cannot comment on, except that, um, and as our, I think our Director General highlighted, there is this advisory commission um, for the Rakhine State, um, final recommendations that were issued um, in August, uh, a few days before the 25th of August, that provides the basis, it seems, mm -hmm. for a political solution. That is uh, well, all I can say What about the New York Decla Declaration signed last year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in November? Mm. Uh, what about it, New York? Uh, that, does that reflect on the current situation in Myanmar? Um, I, I think it does reflect in the sense that um, it drew the attention to the fact that uh, we need to, the priority needs to be humanitarian access to vulnerable migrant or refugee populations or people that are internally displaced. And I think in that sense, uh, the New York Declaration of last year um, is a good base document that underscores again the fact that this is not an option. It's something that the international community as a whole agrees upon. When people are in this type of situation, we need to be able to provide humanitarian assistance. And I think that in that sense, the document is useful as a reminder uh, that this is not just the opinion of IOM, it's not the opinion of UNHCR, it's not even just the opinion of the UN Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary General, it is the UN member states that came together as a global community and said this is what we believe. What so we believe I think in that we sense... are going to work exactly. around. Yes. So IOM will continue working with the countries yes. around Myanmar and in Myanmar yes. uh, in order to provide assistance. Absolutely. Can we, can we say that right now? That we can say that right now. Yes, Mr. Yes. Van der Auer, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you. Poštovani gledalci, bio je to gospodin Peter van der Auerart. Govorili smo o trenutnoj situaciji u Mijanmaru sa manjinskim muslim, muslimanskim stanovništvom Rohinja. Hvala vam što ste bili večera s nama. Doviđenje.